We now turn specifically to a study of input markets, that is, situations where you have, as I have on the left-hand diagram, supply by households and demand by firms. Let's think about the notions of social surplus in that case. Again, with simplicity, let's suppose that we're discussing this point where supply equals demand. So we can divide the social surplus into two areas, this area and this area. This area on top, as I said before, goes to the demanders. And in this particular case, this is, this, this is the part of social surplus that goes to the firms, because they're the demanders of the input. And then the other part, this goes to the suppliers of the input. And so this is social surplus to the households. So HH is an abbreviation for a household. In other words, to the input suppliers. Now, it turns out we have a special name for this idea of uh, the social surplus to the input to, uh, suppliers. By the way, I'm drawing the demand and supply curve here as straight lines, but they don't have to be straight at all. They can, they can have any kind of curve that you want. So the name that we give the social surplus that goes to the input suppliers is rent. Now sometimes it's called economic rent. To distinguish it from the word the way that the word rent is used in everyday language. But since this is an economic class, I'll usually just call it rent instead of calling it economic rent. So the definition here is completely straightforward. Rent is the social surplus that goes to the input suppliers. But it's natural to ask, why do we call it rent? I mean, rent is something that we pay when we get an apartment or or, uh, or get a machine temporarily. We, we rent something. So why is the social surplus of the input suppliers called rent? So to answer that question, think about modeling the market for land. Land is an input. For example, in agriculture, or if you want to build an apartment building on it, or you want to build a factory on it. So land is an input. So it's consistent to talk about the market for land when we're talking about input markets. I've drawn on the right-hand diagram a standard demand curve, but think about the supply curve. I claim that the market for land, in particular the market for raw land, which means unimproved land, is characterized by a supply curve that's vertical. If you have raw, unimproved land, then it has no opportunity cost. So we're not talking about land with buildings on it. But unimproved land, uh, suppose somebody offered you uh, $200 to rent the land. You'd say, yeah. Suppose they offered you 20 cents to rent the land. Well, if nobody else offered you more, you'd say, yeah. Because raw, unimproved land, by definition, is land that doesn't have any opportunity cost. And so the supply curve is vertical. You take, you take any price to, as, uh, in return for renting out the land for, let's say, one year. Now, in actuality, the price might be really high, but that's because of the demand for land. It's not because of the supply. The supply of land is is fixed. So in the economist's notion of raw, unimproved land, you have a vertical supply curve. Now, think about what that does to, to this area of social surplus that goes to the input suppliers. So I'm drawing it now on the left-hand graph, but what happens if I draw it on the right-hand graph? 
basically what you need to do is think about the left hand graph imagine imagine this point as a pivot point and imagine twisting the supply curve this way I'll draw that in a different color imagine twisting the supply curve this way and this way so that it ends up in in this position in a vertical position okay so so think of now what happens to the area of to the rent area so this line stays the same this stays the same but this is rotating out like that so my claim is that once the supply curve is completely vertical, what's happened is that this whole area is the area of rent. All of it is rent. All of it is social surplus. But you notice that that's also equal to, I'll use a technical term, the factor payment. So in economics, the term factor is often used as a synonym for input. And the on this right-hand diagram, the payment for land is just the price times the quantity. Well, the price is P star, and the quantity is Q star, and price times quantity is that rectangle. So in other words, all of the factor payment, all of the payment for land is economic rent. Let's say the landowner gets a million dollars for renting out his unimproved land for 10 years. He would have been willing to accept a penny to rent it out for 10 years because he doesn't have any alternative use for it. So the excess of the amount he gets, which is a million dollars, over the amount that he would have been willing to accept, which is essentially you know, zero, it's a penny, is rent. And the rent is the whole factor payment. So when we're discussing the market for raw, unimproved land, the entire factor payment is economic rent. Now in everyday language, the payment for land is rent. So that's the reason why the term economic rent uses the word rent. That's, that was the inspiration for it. That's why economists decided to call it that. Because when you're studying the market for land, the entire payment is a rent. Now, economic rent is used in other kinds of markets, like the one on the left. It, again, economic rent just means the social surplus, the input supplier. So it's not always the whole factor payment. And in the graph on the left, it isn't. It's the, the triangular area there. Another place where you sometimes hear economic rent discussed is in the labor market. For example, what's the economic rent involved in the salary to uh, somebody who plays in the National Basketball Association, a professional athlete. Often these athletes have are earning very high rents because the rent is the excess over what they receive over what they would have been willing to receive in order to play basketball. And let's say if they weren't playing basketball, then their next best alternative was doing something that would earn them $50,000 a year. Then they would have been willing to play in the National Basketball Association for just a little bit more than $50,000 a year because their fallback position was a $50,000 a year job. So if they're actually earning $2 million a year, then they're earning uh, the difference between their salary, which is $2 million, and $50,000 in economic rent. That's the excess of what they're actually earning over what you would have had to pay them, the minimum amount you would have had to pay them in order to play in the NBA and that was 50000 So 2 million minus 50000 is their rent. So a lot of their salary is rent. So that's another example of how you use the word uh, rent when you're talking about input markets. The fact that all of payment for raw, unimproved land is rent means that if the government taxed lots of that away, it would be non-distortionary because you wouldn't be changing the total amount of of land that was supplied to the marketplace. This inspired 
a very well-known late 19th century American politician and economist named Henry George. to propose that the government finance itself exclusively or almost exclusively through a tax on land. He advocated this as a way of eliminating poverty and decreasing income inequality by, uh, by financing the government with uh, taxes on land. Uh, Henry George became politically very popular in the late 19th century and if you're interested in in, uh, in his work and how he became interested in this notion of poverty alleviation and decreasing inequality of income, there are any number of sources you can look at. Even uh, Wikipedia on the internet has an introductory article about Henry George. Another thing I wanted to mention is what is the nature of demand curve in these input markets? So, so we have demand by firms here. The, it's like the demand for water and demand for fertilizer. S and one of the puzzles that economists were trying to figure out in the early 19th century was take the uh, the the price of, take the, think about the price of land and its relationship to the price of food. Okay, in England in the early 19th century, all grains were called corn and so economists talk about the price of land and the price of corn so corn wasn't just uh, maize it was any kind of grain so the question they were trying to ask is is a high price of corn caused by a high price of land or is a high price of land caused by a high price of corn so I typed on the right hand side of the screen this question see what economists even at that time when statistics were very primitive, were easily able to see is that there was a positive correlation between the price of corn and the price of land. You saw both of them going up at the same time, both of them going down at the same time. But since economists can't do controlled experiments, we, the question was which way did the causality run? Was it, as the first one here, the high price of land causing the price of corn to be high? So in other words, when the land price increased, then that pushed up the price of corn? Or was it the reverse? Was it the high price of corn causing the high price of land, so that when the price of corn went up, that caused the price of land to go up? Even modern economics often has a very hard time with these questions of causality. It's often quite easy just looking at statistics to see that one thing is correlated with another thing, either positively or negatively. But trying to figure out what which one of them caused the other or if they were both caused by some third factor is sometimes impossible or at least very difficult and um, or it requires a theoretical understanding of what's happening not just looking at the data so among other economists it was David Ricardo who was in the next generation of economists after Adam Smith. Uh, Ricardo and Thomas Malthus knew each other quite well and so they were contemporaries and they were the next generation of English economists after Adam Smith. David Ricardo figured out the answer to the question. And the answer to this question is the high price of land is caused by the high price of corn. And it's not that the high price of corn is caused by a high price of land. The reason is as, as follows. The only reason why a farmer wants land in the first place is to get corn. So the demand for the input, it's, it's, it's demand by firms, it's what we call a derived demand. That is, it comes from something else. The demand for land comes from the price of corn. It's because you want to make corn that you demand land. You don't demand, a farmer doesn't demand land in and of itself. And therefore, if the price of corn goes up, that's going to make farmers want land more, and that's going to raise the price of land. 
So the direction is from the high price of corn to the high price of land. In other words, like we said in the beginning, the high price of land is caused by the high price of corn. The high price of corn is the cause, and the high price of land is the effect. So that was the first instance that, that uh, or one of the first instances that I'm aware of, an, of an economist being able to figure out causality.